All right, so tonight we are in uh, Acts 3 and 4, and as you probably saw, there was a significant emphasis on the name of Jesus in our study this week. And we see that the use of name in Acts 3, verse 6, verse 16, and Acts 4, we saw it in 7, 10, 12, 17, 18, and 30. So there was, a, again, an emphasis on the name of Jesus. And we know that a name is much more than how we are identified. It can include our reputation, authority, and our power. And in this particular case, it's referencing the power of Jesus Christ. So how important is a name? Proverbs 22.1 says, A good name is more desirable than great riches. To be esteemed is better than silver and gold. So a name is a pretty big deal. And we see that Peter boldly declared that salvation is found in no one other than the name of Jesus. And it was by this that God had made the determination that mankind would be saved. So again, we're going to see that theme of saved salvation through this as well. And salvation, if you look at the definition, is the act of saving, preservation from destruction, danger, deliverance from enemies. It's also rescue to be set free or delivered from danger or evil. And I'm sure that many of us here, uh, when we were lost and were found by Christ, we would describe that as having been rescued. That's certainly how I viewed it for myself personally, that I felt like he had rescued me, redeemed me, and then restored me into a right relationship with him. But there's no question that when you look at that definition, so again, (laughs) this is crazy. Excuse me for a second. We, We... it's kind of amazing with the technology. So did you? Let me just see what he's got there. Um, would you mind asking John? Because John usually looks into it. Whoop. Yeah, thanks. It's not, you know, uh, Okay. All right, so actually, it looks like we're good. John, is, uh, John just sent the note saying that he's seeing it. You know that when you have spiritual attacks, things that are happening are coming from multiple directions, you know that we're on the right path, right? But I have to say that I, I can't remember a year uh, where we have started with so many like little issues or, or health issues or something else. But in any case, <laughs> we'll get back on track. So again, we, we know when we look at that definition that it's pretty clear that that is, and it, and it is applicable to our own lives, right? And we know that, that the salvation that God offers us, he is preserving and protecting us from the evil, the dangers, even if it's from ourselves. Uh, we also know that salvation includes deliverance from the penalty of sin and its power over our lives. The Holy Spirit draws us and restores that relationship with Jesus Christ. One pastor and author said this, and I thought it was just really good. This is actually was shared by John. If Jesus rose from the dead, then you have to accept all that he said. If he didn't rise from the dead, then why worry about anything, he said. The issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching, but whether or not he rose from the dead. And that is the foundation of our faith, as we talked about in our our first week. So in our study this week, we saw the evidence, and we will continue to see the evidence of the Holy Spirit's transformation in Peter and John as they boldly proclaimed the name of Jesus. And we, so the big idea tonight is that salvation in the name of Jesus offers healing and new life. We have three divisions tonight. So it's the power of salvation seen in healing, seen in bold witness, and seen, and seen lived out sacrificially. So as we begin in chapter, uh, chapter 3, we see Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. A man unable to walk since birth was being carried into the temple gate area. And that was something that was going on every day, where he would beg from people who were entering into the temple courtyards. He saw Peter and John as they were about to enter, and he asked them for money. Then Peter looked straight at him, and said, as did John, and said to him, look at us. And so the man watched them closely, text tells us and he expected something from them. So we see that Peter said, Silver or gold I do not have, but I'll give you what I do have. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, get up and walk. And I would suggest that just as Peter stepped out of the boat on the water when Jesus called him, he was the only one to get out of the boat. That was quite an act of faith. It was also quite an act of faith on his part at this point, because he had not done a physical healing up until this particular point. 
Then Peter took this man by the right hand, and he helped him up. And at once the man's feet and ankles were healed and restored. They became strong. And he jumped up, and he began to walk. And then he walked with Peter uh, and John into the temple courtyards, continuously walking, jumping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the same man who used to sit and beg at the temple gate called Beautiful. They were filled with wonder. I think that would be an understatement. They were amazed at what had happened to him. So we see that this helpless, hopeless man was used to asking and expecting money to meet immediate needs. But God wanted to do more, far more. He gave him hope, mobility, and the capacity to help himself and others. So, what does the range of asks look like in our life? What are we asking for? Are we praying boldly? Are we, we're certainly praying boldly for God to provide supernatural healing to Matt to confound the medical uh, practitioners. But do we pray boldly to God to meet our true needs or just those things that are pressing? The truth is, God wants to give us so much more. He wants to give us new life. And he wants to help us with all of our problems, not just the little ones that we may get caught up in. We see that, he, we see that meeting needs demonstrates that we care. It demonstrates compassion. And that opens up the hearts of those that we are meeting needs for so that we can then share the hope that we have in Christ with them. So again, that's just so critical how we're interacting with people in our day-to-day lives. Now, there are many here tonight and who are watching can attest to having experienced the healing touch of God in their lives. And how did we respond? Did we exhibit the excitement, the wonder that this man did? Did we jump up and down for joy praising God? Have you shared, invited, or led others to Jesus out of gratitude for what he has done for you? We can always call on the name of Jesus in prayer for other people. And that, I would suggest, is really a great way to start a conversation with people, is, is that, especially if you notice that they're struggling with something. You say, is there something that I can pray for you about? Most people are not going to say no. The healing and new life that we received when God touched our lives should be evident and should create wonder and amazement in our family, our friends, our co-workers, our neighbors, and so forth. And again, it's that amazement that when they see a transformed life in us, that they will be drawn to ask about what happened, just like we saw in our study tonight. So with that, Clint, who's one of our group leaders, shared with the leaders on Friday a personal story of his and so we actually, on, at Leaders on Friday, we have two stories, so we may run a little bit longer, but they were just so powerful how God weaved those into what we're studying this week. So go ahead, Clint. Good evening. My name is Clint Minix, and uh, Bill asked me to uh, share this story, and how can you say no to a face like that? <laughs> so... Um, it was an answer to a, 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 a question. What, what in your life, um, this is one of the questions, I think it's question four or five. What, what in, in your life do you praise God for and you know it was God and you have no question that it, that it was God who had, um, who had done it? Um, uh, my story is, is quite simple. Well, it's not simple, but it's short. Um, I was addicted to powdered cocaine. In in the early 80s, and um, I immersed myself in the Bible and reading reading the Bible, uh, going to Sunday school and 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 prayer. I mean that's that's I just, I just that's just all I did because I was begging God to to take that um, addiction away from me. Um, I did not go to uh, rehab. That was probably not a wise decision. But anytime you you have some kind of addiction, I do recommend rehab. But I didn't go uh, 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 to rehab. So uh, and God took that addiction away from me. So I can only uh, credit God for that. 
it it was you know I, I it was it was nothing it was nothing and I appreciate not that's why I have the towel. <laughs> um, y'all see I'm bigger crabby than I am. <clears throat> that's also, the Holy Spirit. I, uh, <laughs> I get emotional when I uh, <clears throat> share it. So that's my story and just thanks for listening. You can bet that there have been many amazed and um, uh, astonished people that knew Clint then and have seen the transformation now. So in our, in our passage, all the people were astonished by the healing that, and came running to Peter and John. And, they said, and so Peter says, fellow Israelites, why does this surprise you? And then he leveraged their interest to help point them to Jesus Christ. We should be able to do the same exact thing says, why do you stare at us as if by our power or godliness we made this man walk? Peter says plainly that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob glorified his servant Jesus. Then he says to them, right, very pointedly, you handed him over to be killed. You disowned and rejected him before Pilate. You asked for a murderer to be released. You killed the author of life. But God raised him, verifying his claims. And then he's saying, we are witnesses. Peter attributes the healing to the power of the resurrected Jesus by faith in his name. And then Peter argues in verses 17 to 26 that if you believe Moses, you should believe in Jesus. So we then see in the big picture here, and this is true then, it's true today, refusal to believe is rooted in either a lack of understanding of the scriptures or an unwillingness to grasp what the prophets had announced. What did they announce? The anointed one would suffer, die, and be raised to life. The challenge is that for many, many years, they were expecting a king like Joshua, a conquering king. They were not expecting a crucified savior. Peter addresses this lack of understanding and tells him to repent and turn to God so that their sins would be forgiven and so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Now, Clint's story is a powerful reminder, and I'm sure many here would agree, that we all benefit from a fresh start in spiritual renewal, renewal that comes when God steps into our lives and restores our relationship with him. So in verse 22, Moses said, The Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me. He will be one of your own people. You must listen to everything he tells you. Anyone who does not listen will be completely cut off from their people. Now, it's interesting. If you go back to the the uh, transfiguration, God spoke and said, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. And I just gave that to you, right? Are we listening, however? And that's always the challenge, just like the old radios. The signal is being um, su- submitted from the radio towers, but we have to tune in and be able to, in order to be able to hear them. And I think the same thing is true when we're trying to hear and listen to what God is saying to us. Every person must make a choice about who Jesus is. Either he is who he said he is and who he claimed to be, and we listen, follow, and obey, Or we ignore the proofs, the evidence, and the eyewitness accounts. But it is our choice. So that's our first main truth tonight. God provides the proofs, evidence, and opportunity for people to believe in Jesus Christ. But what was the religious leader's response? They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And obviously that split the Sanhedrin because you had the the Pharisees and then you had the Sadducees, and the Sadducees didn't believe in a resurrection to to life. So they... Sad sad you see, exactly. (laughs) So they seized them and put them in jail until the next day. But many who had heard their message believed, so the number of men, and then we have to remember that they always say refer to men so they don't include women or children or anybody else that might have been present. So it was at least 5,000 grew as followers of Jesus. 
the greatest benefit that God sent uh, that God sent Jesus to the Jews first. So that was a blessing to them. He was their Messiah. Peter said, God raised up Jesus. God sent him to you first. He did it to bless you. And he wanted each of you to turn from your wicked ways. And that, quite frankly, is what God wants for all of us. But sadly, the greatest of all sins is the failure to acknowledge the truth about Jesus and repent. And again, we just talked about the proofs, the evidence, and the eyewitness accounts that he has provided for us. So the religious leaders leaders asked Peter and John, by what power or name did you do this? Peter said, rulers and elders of Israel, we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and how he was healed. Then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Pretty bold. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Then we see that the religious leaders saw the courage of Peter and John, who were unschooled, ordinary men. And they were astonished. And they noted that they had been with Jesus. So the question would be again for us, is that as we spend time in study of the Bible here in BSF, in our own private time and in our studies in churches, as we look more and more like Jesus, would other people be astonished at the growth and the transformation that they've seen in you? And would that cause them to be drawn to ask you about that? So we see that the religious leaders were confronted with truth, evidenced by the healed man that was in front of them. They knew him, and he was standing in front of them. Yet they were unwilling to believe that God was speaking through the apostles and this miracle. And their response is they tell Peter and John to stop speaking to anyone in this name, and they commanded them to not speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Again, what boldness and courageousness, right? Courage. Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes? To listen to you or to listen to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help but speak about what we have seen and heard. Wouldn't that be great if that were said about all of us as well? And that brings us to our second main truth. That the Holy Spirit affirms our identity in Christ so we can share boldly the hope we have in Jesus. And now we have the other personal story that fits so perfectly with this. And so Anatoly is, again, one of our uh, group leaders. Many of you know Anatoly. I'll let you come on up. So he and I, uh, after leaders meeting, uh, again, after he had shared, uh, we, we, we met and uh, sat down and reviewed his story. So I took copious notes, and then I... I typed them out so that I could read to you the story of his father, Alexander. Because it's a pretty powerful story, by the way. And we're seeing in our study, we're talking about eyewitness accounts. People that that were were faced with risks and things that were unspeakable for us to even even contemplate. So listen to this, um, uh, Anatoly's dad. It says, Alexander Makutin was born in Russia and is the father of Anatoly, one of our group leaders. He served as a soldier during World War II in the area of Stalingrad, and in in December 1941, he was walking through the fields of a large collective and was drawn to a small cabin in the distance where he could see a faint light on the inside. He approached the cabin, and he knocked and was invited in by an older man. The cabin had very little in it, very sparse, and the light was from a candle, a single candle. He noticed a shelf that had one book on it, and he asked the old man about it. The old man went over, picked up the book, and gave it to Alexander. It was a Bible. The old man said to him, take this and read it. But even if you can't, hold on to it tightly, and your life will be saved during the war. As Alexander left, he sensed that this was a book that he needed. He started to share with his fellow soldiers what he was reading. And many of them told him that he shouldn't be bringing this up. He shouldn't be talking about the Bible. 
and he shouldn't be speaking about or sharing what he was reading. Because if he did, he could be assigned to the front lines. Well, he continued to share boldly with courage, and three days later, he was sent to the front lines. He was assigned to be a truck driver. On, on a mission, Alexander and six other soldiers um, were traveling down a road, and a German bomb dropped on the road near them. The explosion sent the truck tumbling over, and all of the, his fellow soldiers died. Only he survived. He wasn't even wounded. He later said that that Bible was very close to his chest, and it likely protected him from the shrapnel of the bomb. And from that day forward, his faith began to strengthen. After the war, he returned home, and he continued reading his Bible and sharing with his neighbors. One day, the KGB showed up and arrested him. He was brought before a judge and told that if he renounced his belief in God, in Christ, and stopped reading the, the Bible and sharing it, he would be set free. But if not, he, he could be sent to prison for 25 years or be executed. That night, and he was asked to think about it, so that night he prayed. And he said that he sensed and heard from God that he would only spend three years in prison. The next day before the judge, he said, I am not a criminal and I've done nothing wrong. But for the sake of God, I will accept 50 years in prison. And the judge said to him, young man, you will regret this. And he sent him to a gulag in Siberia. In the gulag were murderers and other serious offenders. When Alexander was, uh, and, uh, and so when they would ask him what he was in there for, they were in disbelief that he was sent there because he was reading a Bible and sharing about Christ. So he would continue to share and tell them about Christ with his fellow inmates. And as it turned out, many came to, to, to faith in Christ. And as a result, the overall tension and the atmosphere in the gulag was improving day by day. The men were becoming nicer to each other and with the guards. The authorities began to notice the changes, so they moved him to another prison. In that prison, he continued to share the hope that he had in Christ. And the same improvements began to occur there. So they moved him a third time, and the same exact thing repeated. Eventually, the authorities decided, and I think this is so great, that he was more dangerous in prison, so they set, so they set him free. It was exactly three years to the day that he was sent to prison. So now, returning to civilian life, the KGB kept a very close eye on him. And knowing that the KGB would take any of his Bibles and hymnals, he built many birdhouses. In fact, what was it, eventually 20 birdhouses on the property? 20, at least 20 birdhouses. So he, began, he became known as a bird lover. But little did they know is he was using the birdhouses to hide the Bibles and the hymnals. <laughs> Just figured they weren't going to check there. Okay. Meanwhile, he continued to meet with family, friends, neighbors, and shared Christ with them. And many from the community um, would, come, would come to Christ. They shared what they had. They ate together. They met needs. Does that not sound like what we're reading about this week? Right? And they came to listen to his father speak about God and speak about Christ. And even though he was fined by the authorities several times, this community supported each other, provided the food, the shelter, whatever was needed to help one another. So, some of Anatoly's earliest memories when he was seven or eight years old, what, what do you recall happening at that point? You know, and I'll go the other way. Yeah, you oh, okay. <laughs> I saw people. It's, it, it was unbelievable. In the, like December in Russia, for part of Russia where I uh, lived, yeah, it good. was very cold. So they... Not, was not allowed to get together, even worship at houses, people. So they went to the forest. And they had a community, it was called. And people who came to this communion, and when that's what we start, Acts 1 8, you will receive power when the Holy Ghost 
uh, Holy Spirit comes on you. And when it touch their hearts, they tell that we don't want wait till summer. We want to be baptized in winter time. So they cut ice in the river holes, and they were baptized in winter time. But those unbelievable unity and boldness and courageous, it was just amazing how the darker nights, the brighter star were. Everybody united in this difficult time. So also, you had indicated how your father modeled for you the importance of reading the Bible. So tell us what that looked like for you as a, as a child. As a child, I, as far as I re- remember, not only from 70 years, we, uh, the house rules was he read Bible in the morning, one or two chapters every, every morning before breakfast. If somebody overslept, I have, I have five brothers and four sisters. And I didn't want to miss my breakfast. So we read one or two chapter, chapter before breakfast. There you go. And so the story ends with Anatoly moving to the United States in 1989, so 30 years ago. His father, at age 75, had his record in Russia expunged. And then he and other family members ultimately came to the United States in 1992. And at age 95, he became a U.S. citizen. So praise God, right? Actually, actually he was, a, it, it, it's type, he was 95. He proved that any age you can, uh, never too late to learn, uh, to study something. At age 95, he became citizen of the United States. But uh, uh, the, the story, and just, just yeah. quickly, uh, I remember when, when he came from prison system, KGB agent was assigned to him about three or four people and they follow every step. Occasionally, they come to your house and they search all books to make sure that uh, there's nothing suspicious like Bibles or anything else. But after a year and a half, two years, those KGB agents realized that he was nothing doing wrong. They became not only nice people, they became Christian and later ministers. (laughs) <laughs> so you can imagine I had, I had worked up a slightly different version of the lecture and then after uh, Friday morning with Clint and uh, uh, Anatoly I said no wait a minute you all had to hear this because it's just so powerful I mean almost that could be the whole lecture just listening to those two stories right <laughs> right so so we see that in, in, this, in, in, our, in our passages, Peter and John were released, and they reported all that had happened. They raised their voices in prayer to God, saying, Sovereign Lord. They, so they were acknowledging that God is all-powerful, that there is nothing outside of his control, and certainly not anybody that was going to oppose God and his plans. They prayed, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your words with great boldness. What's interesting is these first followers wanted to be faithful witnesses. But notice what they did not pray for. They didn't pray for protection. They asked for boldness to continue to speak. Luke tells us their prayer was answered by a display of divine power as the place they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. I would say that that would be a massive level of encouragement for them to continue on as they were. All the believers were one in heart and mind, and they were generous as they shared with each other, selling possessions and property and meeting the needs of others. And we see that the apostles continued to testify about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And that brings us to our third main truth. The ability to love one another as Jesus loved us and to live sacrificially is only possible through the Holy Spirit. Jesus' new command... Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So, if you think about Alexander's story, and others who you may know, they were great ambassadors for Christ, despite the risks associated with that. Do they inspire you to courageously and boldly step out by faith and to love one another? Because we're going to see a lot of one another through the study of the book of Acts. We see chapter 4 ends with a great description of the life of the early followers of Jesus. Love for one another, love for one another, harmony, 
unity, generosity, and praying together. This new ecclesia of Jesus, this new community, was enabled by the Holy Spirit. They were unstoppable. And by their love, unity, generosity, and self-sacrifice, it made them irresistible. They were drawing other people to Jesus by the way in which they lived, which was so countercultural at that time. I would say that that would be pretty much true today. If we started living the way they did, it would still be countercultural today. Maybe not as extreme. So some reflection points. What excites you more? Helping people or your hobbies, sports teams, and other types of activities? How easy would you sacrifice your free time and your resources to help someone? And then maybe importantly, what needs to change for you to become more one another focused? So Clint, can I ask you to pray us out? Thanks, guys. Have a great night sharing.